Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. So So I saw that everybody, all teams could uh, successfully submit the assignments, okay, uh, which is good. I hope it was not too difficult. Uh, we'll see if uh, towards the end of this lecture we can uh, go through the uh, solutions or ideas related to the solutions. Um, but do you have any questions rega regarding this, you know, the assignment that you just uh, submitted in? Any questions? Nobody has any questions, everybody. I saw some of the solutions already. Uh, one pattern was some of you did not describe anything. You've seen, you, you've given the code uh, and maybe plots, but you did not write a sentence or two about what you're doing in, in the sub part, okay? Uh, so that's where the text field, the markdown, you know, you can create a cell and change it to a markdown variation and you could have written something, right? Okay, I have two curves, you know, at two different learning rates and, you know, one is better than the other. Or, or something like that, some textual description, okay? Uh, but otherwise, everybody found the assignments okay? Was there anything more, you know, more challenging? I know some, so everybody has background in Python, is it? I, I know the first day some of you did not have. Uh, I think by the end of this assignment, we got some background. Okay. <laughs> it did help in that. Okay. Uh, so that's good, so I mean, the first assignment was, uh, uh, just to get, you know, get a feel for using Python and, you know, we work pretty much, work, I, I think the interesting data set was just MNIST or uh, Fashion MNIST, right? Uh, and also you try to use Keras, Keras and TensorFlow. How many of you had to struggle with installing TensorFlow on Windows machines? Okay, few of you. Uh, so what did you guys do eventually? Python. What is it? Okay. Okay. So many of you are you guys using uh, Anaconda distribution? So, so you wanna so learn a little bit about Python environments. I, I think you guys actually did that. So Python environments, you can uh, you know change the Python version itself as well as uh, create uh, you know that environment specific packages. You can have uh, environment specific, specific packages if you're trying something out and you can actually delete the environment and create another one. It's like it's like virtual machines, but specific to Python, you know. Um, let's see. So the second thing is uh, how many of you did not yet log into the GPU machine assigned to your team? Okay. Uh, so so there, are, there are about nine teams. So who's not in a team yet? I mean, because you submitted assignments, everybody is in a team. Uh, but uh, so some of you have not logged in. So follow the instructions. Actually, somebody pointed out that even if you are on UIC Wi-Fi, you have to connect to VPN. Okay, so I, I forgot to add that in the original instructions. Uh, so irrespective of where you are, just connect to the VPN, and then you can log in. Uh, and uh, there's a video of how to get the SSH key uh, from your local machine. So it's it's a machine-specific key that you generate, whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux. You, you create a key, there's a key, private key and a public key. The public key has a .pub at the end as a file name. So you copy the contents of the public key onto the server that is assigned to you. And uh, and then you don't have to keep typing the password or copy pasting the password. Uh, and also it's more secure, uh, passwords will be disabled so that uh, only your machines can log into the systems, okay? Um, I will try to see if I can uh, log into the machine and uh, uh, demonstrate something uh, in the second part of the lecture. Let's see. Okay. So next I'm gonna just uh, quickly go over the learning goals because I mean, uh, we'll try to get a high level context of uh, what we did and where we're going, okay? Uh, so this is something I, I did even for my another class that I'm teaching, you know, statistical models and methods, 575. So what are the goals for this class? Uh, so many of you, actually 572 and 575 are requirements for this class. So as we, essentially, you need to have some background in machine learning, introduction to machine learning, 
right. So given that you have some background in some machine learning tools, maybe shallow methods like SVM, uh, random forest, decision trees and so on. Um, in this class, you want to kind of get intuition for different deep learning models. So a lot of it is engineering, okay, you're fitting, essentially fitting a high dimensional uh, or high parameter count based, uh, you know, nonlinear models. And so there's really, no, it's mostly, you know, a good chunk of it is intuition driven, okay, engineering driven. So that's what we want to get out of this course. Um, the models will be, of course, specific to the tasks that we have. And initially, we'll see. Um, so today's lecture, for example, is mostly about vision. Next lecture will be about text, next couple of lectures. Uh, so we'll see how the models and the choices you make change as you have different types of data sets, okay. And actually, last week, when we saw CNNs, it, there was some, you know, uh, why CNN and not just a feed forward network we'll get to, actually, right after this. Uh, but there was something about the structure of that type of data, which is images, that we were exploiting when we chose a CNN architecture. And we'll get to that uh, right after this, okay. Uh, second thing is confidence while considering uh, use of deep learning models. So a couple of years ago, it would have been difficult to get, you know, uh, really train uh, or work with uh, really good uh, deep learning models other than, you know, two or three layer hidden networks, uh, hidden layer networks. Uh, but uh, state of the art, not a state of the art, state of the practice has come to uh, such a level that uh, we can actually, uh, you know, even though we are not uh, experts in deep learning, we can actually uh, pretty much sample uh, really good architectures and run them on, on machines and actually good, good performance on tasks, which five years ago nobody could have done it except for a few research groups, okay. So, so that's the second, you know, you need to get some confidence in using uh, uh, deep learning tools. It's yet another tool in your toolkit, right? Um, third is, uh, of course, uh, what choices are being made. So you'll see that we're actually not, for example, one instance of this is that we are not really doing uh, cross-validation, okay, explicitly. So for example, uh, you may just have one validation data set, uh, one training data set, and you're minimizing, uh, you know, you're backdropping and figuring out the loss on your training data set and fitting the parameters. And in your epochs, you are just outputting the performance on the validation uh, separate held out data. Okay, um, you haven't put it under a loop where you actually cross validate, cross validate, and figure out what is the best learning rate, what is the best uh, uh, choice of uh, number of hidden layers, and so on. You have not done it, and typically it's it's going to be difficult to do it because training even a single version um, is hard. So here we kind of uh, there's not much emphasis on cross cross validation to choose the right choices. Some right choices have already been made by other experts, so we'll kind of uh, use them as defaults. And, and we'll see this uh, pattern more, okay? So there's slight difference in workflow when you go from shallow models to, for example, deep models. And uh, and we'll also try to use some good packages. So you've try, tried uh, TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, we'll also, so there was a convolutional neural network uh, script from uh, PyTorch tutorial uh, page that I had uh, um, given in addition to the lecture notes in, in the syllabus page, right? So, so PyTorch, CAFE, MXNet, uh, there are many uh, uh, different uh, in, instantiations of uh, the same ideas about back propagating, constructing uh, differentiable, highly nonlinear functions and uh, learning good models. So we'll see, you know, we'll probably zero in on uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow uh, and work with some decent sized data sets. So in that regard, uh, I've also released the second uh, assignment. It's a, it only has two questions, uh, but the first part, first question depends on, uh, uh, asks you to work with something called the CIFAR 10 data set, okay? It's a image data set. Uh, there is gonna be three dimensions, you know, red, blue, green, you know, for, for each image. Image sizes are pretty small. It's 32 cross 32, but still you'll see that uh, working with that data set is kind of hard if you want to quickly have a training loop and get to a good model. Uh, unless you have a GPU. So if you do CIFAR 10 on a uh, uh, CPU-based machine, uh, it will be pretty slow. You'll see the uh, differences. You might not have seen that on, on MNIST, for example, okay? Um, and the second uh, uh, part of the assignment is about uh, learning what are called embeddings, and we'll see embeddings uh, when we talk about text data next, next lecture. Okay. So, So there are a few goals, so I've tried to create a slide for each uh, lecture. So go through, you know, what were the goals for lecture one and lecture two uh, uh, 
later. But what are the goals for uh, lecture three? Uh, the first goal is to understand uh, uh, transfer learning, essentially, how to transfer what we learned on a certain data set to another data set. Okay, so it's not you know there's nothing magical here. So we'll see see how to intuit about how to transfer. Uh, this is one of the easiest instances of transferring. There are other more complicated instances of transferring information or what you learn from one uh, task domain to another task and domain. Um, uh, but this one is uh, somewhat the simplest one, and we'll see how to do that. Uh, the second goal is to uh, uh, different ways to kind of, uh, I guess, visualize what what a, a trained neural network. So you've already kind of trained a network. It's performing at some performance level, accuracy number, right? Uh, but we want to kind of still prod it and see what's happening because ultimately it's still a black box, uh, highly nonlinear function. So we want to understand how it uh, works. Okay. Um, third thing is uh, actually I, I would say not really engineering tricks, and these are uh, essentially uh, uh, tools to kind of uh, uh, um, I would say increase increase or decrease the bias variance trade off of a model. So uh, this bias variance trade-off essentially means you have more complex models, may have high variance and less bias, and you have uh, simpler models means uh, high bias and uh, low variance. So, you know things like dropout uh, essentially are way to uh, regularize or essentially push the uh, you know push the model towards more bias. Okay, uh, and there are things like batch normalization, weight initialization, and so on. These are all considerations that let you get a better model. Okay. And we'll see why we need all this, and why can't we just uh, start with some default and get to a good model always? Uh, maybe we can ask that question when we get there. Okay. Um, and also, uh, the last goal is to understand uh, this idea of data augmentation, which is popular for image data. Uh, for text data, it's not very clear how to augment data, but we'll see. Uh, this is a very useful trick to kind of get a uh, uh, good bang per buck for your, you know, uh, deep learning model. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. I'll try to use the slides, and I'll also try to use the uh, last time I used the uh, uh, notepad, right? So we'll see. Um, okay. How do I go back and forth? Okay. So, so what's today's outline? Uh, today we're going to look at uh, uh, three things. First, we'll try to do the uh, debugging CNNs, essentially, uh, partial attempts to debug CNNs, and next we'll get to the transfer learning. Uh, and then the last part would be a few things that uh, have become standard these days, uh, especially dropout, batch normalization, and stuff. Uh, we'll get there. Okay. Um, so, actually, I had a URL for this. So. Okay, that didn't work. Ah, okay. Okay. 
Okay, I just wanted to start with a visualization of a neural net. Visualization of a convolutional neural net. So this is, uh, I don't know if the lights here are not giving you good shade, but uh, so what's happening in this page? Um, let me just, um, yeah. So on the bottom right corner, there's a bunch of uh, layers, which layers are visible or not. So I'm going to actually uh, remove some of the layers. I mean, I, so, okay. So actually let me keep the layers. So, yeah. So in this uh, diagram, so we have a starting uh, point, which is the bottom. Okay. So some dark square, right? So that's going to be the input image essentially. Uh, there's a bunch of boxes again here. So these are, this is going to be your first con layer. So we, we'll see, I'll, I'll explain more, but I'm just telling you what, what those boxes are first. So this is going to be the first layer, uh, this big boxes. And then there's a smaller box here at the third level. That's going to be your uh, max pooling level. Okay. And then there's a repeat of the same type of uh, thing later on. Okay. And then this uh, flat lines here, I don't know if you can see the dark, um, uh, there's a flat line, couple of lines, right? Those, those are fully connected layers. Okay. Uh, I don't think I can change the contrast for this guy, but okay. So now let me remove some of the layers. Um, uh, all the layer. Okay. So now there are only three, uh, three things, three levels, right? Starting with a box, I have a bunch of other boxes and, and then another set of boxes. So, Think of uh, the, this first box as a uh, input image. It doesn't have depth. Then there are there are six boxes at the second row, right? So each of the six boxes is essentially a filter. Uh, actually, it's not a filter itself, but each boxes each box in the second second row is a is a slice is a filter output. Okay. So the filter size itself, I don't know if you can see, it's like a really small. So I'm pointing to a pixel or essentially an output neuron over there, uh, sorry, an activation over there. And that activation was by multiplying a filter, which was of small size in this part of the input image. Okay. So do an element wise multiplication of a filter. We are not showing the filter itself. These, uh, you know, colored edges are representing the filter filter, right? It's a small filter. It's doing element wise multiplication of entries over here, adding it up some number and that number is uh, stored over there. Okay. Uh, in fact, that number and then a nonlinear activation like uh, activation function like ReLU would be a zero uh, max of zero on that number. That's the numbers being stored here. Okay. So, and the same thing is happening everywhere. Uh, so there are six filters. So all filters are taking looking at the same different different regions. Top, starting from top left, they keep going right uh, and create this output slice. So the output tensor. So input tensor was of depth one. So there is no, there is no, no, you know, do no depth degenerate. It's just one depth. Okay. Output tensor is of depth six, right? There are six uh, filters, six sets of six filters, and they create one filter creates one slice or essentially one matrix, and you can stack all of them together, and that's your tensor. Okay. That's your output tensor. Uh, so let's say those are the numbers. Then the next. There are six other small boxes, and these are kind of uh, obvious. These are uh, the max pool boxes, okay, or essentially pooling layer boxes, okay. Essentially, what has happened is if it is ten cross ten, this has become five cross five, okay, something like that. I mean, it depends on how you choose, you know, how many numbers you're pooling together to get one number, and how you're choosing the pooling operation itself, whether the max or the min or the average, whichever way you choose, okay, and then. Now layer two, so that's the output of the pooling. So that now I have a tensor which is still of depth six, but smaller boxes, space, you know, width versus height. Uh, at layer two, okay, actually it's not showing the connection from a couple of guys, but layer two filter is actually a filter which is indicated by all these colored uh, bars. Actually, there should be more, but um, okay, it it's not showing the animation, but it should also show the edges from the 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 one on the left and one on the right as well. Okay, so that filter is computing 
you know, that filter has a depth six, which means that it's taking it. The filter has a depth six means that it's a it's a small matrix. It's a collection of small you know uh, matrices of this size, and uh, there is six of them. Each one multiplies with a same region in each of these uh, matrices. Okay, uh, gets one number per per matrix. Adds all those numbers up. You gain finally get one number and do a max of zero on that number, and that's the output there. So so each of the filter does that. So how many filters are there here? Four, four. Looks like there are 16 filters, right? So that's the output size now. Output size is going to be 16 in depth. And uh, the size, the width and height of the output tensor is going to be, it just depends on how big was my filter and how big was my uh, input tensor. Okay. So that's pretty much it, I think. Again, they did a max pool, so essentially think of height and width getting divided by two or something. And uh, and then there's a fully connected layer, which means that there's no notion of a filter, or there is a notion of a filter in a degenerate sense, but let's not worry about it. So uh, so that's the output. Uh, so that's the that layer is a fully connected layer. So each neuron there is connected to every entry in all these matrices, all the uh, max pool uh, output matrices. Okay. So that's too many parameters, uh, but that's roughly a structure of a con, con relu max pool, con relu max pool, okay. and then a fully connected. But that's uh, we'll get there. Is there any any ambiguity about how uh, how the, how it's laid out? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I understand that. The purpose of all of these convolutions is yeah. for is to decrease the dimensionality of the first image. I mean, so the dimensionality of the first one is so high, you cannot basically. Uh, so we'll actually get to an example which counts dimension. There are a few other things. Why, why CNN and why not a fully connected network? We'll, 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 uh, is that your question? Yeah, eventually. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so basically yeah. you're creating so many parameters. Yes. And you need to evaluate all of them. We need to update. Yeah, there are too many. Uh, maybe thousands or millions depends so, on. So, yeah. is it really helpful that creating so many parameters? Yeah. And so there is a trade off. You are creating so many parameters and yeah. decreasing the dimensionality of, let's say, an image. Um, We're not really decreasing dimensionality, right? Maybe there are, let's say, in CIFAR ten, it's thirty two cross thirty two cross three, which is some you know nine hundred or you know, nine thousand or something like that, right? Uh, those many numbers. That fully connected layer may have more than nine thousand numbers, so I don't know if you're if you're roughly counting dimensionality that way. It's not really clear if you are decreasing the dimensionality. Uh, but there's a lot of I mean, essentially, this is just a pictorial view of a function. You know, it's just mapping from that image to you know a vector of activations at every layer, eventually to the output layer where you only have uh, ten you know scores score vector which is going to be depending on if it's if r ten there is only ten classes so ultimately you're mapping any image to a ten dimensional vector right um, yeah so then I cannot understand why this we'll, structure will help yeah so we'll talk about why the structure will help uh, right now yeah oh yeah here right you can let's say I draw three. I don't know. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So, what is your question now? <laughs> oh, okay. So it's just uh, no. I mean, so then it's basically. I mean, okay. So I guess this. Uh, I'm, okay. Let's directly get to his question. Why uh, CNN architecture? And why not any other? Why not uh, directly a fully connected network, for example? Right. Uh, in fact, why not something else anyway? But uh, why not a fully connected would be the closest uh, neural network, I guess. Uh, so, what filters are trying to do is essentially uh, at the lowest level. What filters are trying to do is actually capture pattern. So each layer, the notion of each layer intuitively is to try to capture some pattern in the input, in its input from its input. Okay. The easiest thing to understand is the first level because clearly the input has some, you know, it's an image, so you can actually see what's what's in that image. Later on, it's kind of hard to figure out what's happening with each tensor, but at an input. You know, at the image level, the bunch of filters, in this case six filters, are trying to capture uh, some pattern in that image. 
okay edges for example uh, like uh, this the one where my mouse is is capturing uh, you know th this high higher color indicates uh, higher activation val values so it's it's uh, capturing uh, that these these patterns exist in this image okay uh, and each, hopefully each of the different filter captures different edges, or it need not just be edges, it could capture other gradients, curvature, and so on. So, they, so you can interpret the first level filters as somehow capturing, uh, doing edge detection, doing uh, contour detection, doing color gradient change detection, and so on, okay? Um, and the use of filters, which are you know smaller size and number, and them scrolling through the spatial aspect is that uh, you have this images where there is, a rotation and translation invariance, right? Whether uh, an object three is it if it's in center of the image or it's at three at the top, or is it you know slightly rotated or and so on translated, uh, you should still detect it, right? So that's why these filters are uh, kind of you know scrolling through the uh, the image uh, and uh, detecting uh, detecting things. So irrespective of where in the image the particular pattern is, maybe the filter can pick it up, okay? Um, yeah, so essentially the notion, the use of convolutions is to detect patterns and these patterns, images have this rotational, translational and, uh, um, and positional, you know, invariance aspects, uh, which is specific to images, uh, which is being captured by CNNs. But you'll see that CNNs can also be used for neural, you know, text and other, other places where there is still some positional information in, in text sentences because words cannot randomly appear. They have to be, uh, there is some temporal aspect to words as well. And we'll get to NLP next time and we'll talk about why CNNs are applicable even for text, okay? But here it's, it's for images, it's very crystal clear, for, at least for the first layer, okay? And the subsequent layers are also supposed to capture, you know, the activations are supposed to capture um, patterns, but then you can't really visualize that because uh, this, this, Let's say, think of this as the input tensor, right? There are six levels for this uh, tensor. It's a tensor of depth six. We just put them next to each other and are actually highlighting which which activations are uh, which activations are high. But uh, similarly, over here we have sixteen tens, sixteen slices. We are just looking at the which which spatial act, you know neurons are activated highly. But it really. Uh, but you can't really think of these as images. You know, it's a little bit flawed uh, intuition that you can think of these as images, but uh, but they activate certain uh, certain neurons. I mean, certain uh, locations are highly activated on certain patterns. And maybe if I draw uh, some other number, let's say eight, uh, instead of these activations, something else will be activated. And eventually, that, that's the dis discrimination between uh, number three and number eight, okay? Uh, how do you ensure that each of these filters that you have, yeah. because uh, like say these two, the first two filters are revenge, I mean, are taking the same, <clears throat> that same part of the input image, right? All the filters are looking at the every, all the filters are looking at the same input image. Yeah. So they how do you filter, ensure that they take different edges? Like, they don't have to. We are not ensuring that they have to. I mean, they can all be detecting the same edge, yeah, the, for example. Uh, so things like stride padding and uh, what else is there? Yeah, things like stride and padding uh, do influence how the output is computed. Of course, you know output dimensions, for example, change if you if you pad uh, stride also. You know stride of length one and two changes the output dimension. But his question is more basic than that. He's asking, okay, I have six filters here. Why are they outputting different uh, activations? Right? Is that is yeah. that the question? I mean, even the, even the stride and padding, it would still eventually the same for all the filters anyway, right? No, the, yeah, the stride and padding, let's say there's the same for all filters, okay? Uh, why are they detecting different uh, edges or different, I guess, this level, they're detecting different uh, parts of the, uh, this number three, right? Um, they don't have to, there is no constraint. In, in this training, there is no requirement that these filters have to be different, but they are being uh, measured by the loss function, right? They better be detecting other, fa other parts of the image if they want to minimize the loss. Okay. You know, that's, yeah, that's kind of intuition. And that's, I know it's not a really good intuition, but they're not, next, they're not expected to be different. You could have a lot of redundancy in this, uh, uh, in, in these types of functions. Maybe the okay. first iteration may be uh, a lot similar, and then when the weights are again uh, with the gradient update. Yeah, 
Yeah, so you can start, so you can initialize the filter weights, which are just parameters, as something. It could be, it could be all the same, which means that the first forward pass, they're all detecting the same thing, uh, whatever they're detecting. And uh, when the gradient update happens, uh, the filters try to capture different aspects. It could, uh, it could happen that all the filters could end up with the same values, okay? It's not um, ruled out. Neurons in? Yeah, this is an artificial neural network as well. So yeah. Yeah, these are the outputs of the neur neurons. I mean, these are essentially the uh, I would say, yeah, these are the activations that you're seeing are the outputs of the neurons. So I guess the easiest part would be this, uh, where you can see this is an A N N. Okay, the, these. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Actually, if you, so that's that's literally an ANN because you can think of these blocks, you know, vectorize those blocks. You know, you got a bunch of block numbers. Just forget about the block structure. Just put them all together, concatenate them. You've got a huge vector. Just multiply it with the weights to get the output of that neuron. That's that's like a ANN part right there, right? That's the usual feedforward neural network. All these are neurons outputs. So this is a neurons output, this is a neurons output. Everything is a neurons output, except that the neurons parameters, you know, the weights are shared by the same filter. So this output and this output, in fact, all outputs on this particular block are shared, are determined by the same weights, okay? Whereas in a fully connected network, different neurons are, connect, are uh, determined by different sets of weights. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so I don't know if the number helped, but uh, let's go forward. Uh, okay, so this is just a you know a same type of diagram. Uh, it's just an a, it's just a rule of thumb. People prefer smaller filters rather than bigger filters, and uh, and you can have like a, you know if you think of blocks, it's like con pool. Uh, con and pool typically go together, and then you have some fully connected layers at the end. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, let's look at this. This is a slightly atypical. You know, this is just an example. I want to. What I want to do with this is just to kind of understand. Okay. Uh, you know, so somebody gives a diagram like this. You want to quickly understand what's the uh, architecture. So. Yeah. So this particular architecture has. Uh, Con layer, so you know the highlighted blue box at the at the front is taking some input image. This is just a you know illustration, uh, and the first con layer has a ten, I think, yeah, uh, has a ten depth, uh, uh, as in ten filters essentially. Okay, so the first con layer is uh, producing ten outputs, ten slices, and they you know you can stack them together, and you get a tensor. Okay, and why are there two sequences, two columns of things? Uh, the first column is just the uh, uh, output of the uh, filter filters output. The second column is the max, uh, you know, ReLU operation. Okay. So the second column you can think of as, as some detecting some edges or something like that. I mean, even the first column is supposed to detect detect same same thing. Second column is just doing a max of zero comma that number. Okay. Uh, so a con layer is followed by a con layer, and then some pooling operation, and uh, and same thing several times, and then the last. Uh, thing is going from uh, this whatever is the dimensionality here, okay. This is a tensor, but I'm not telling you what the size and the you know width and the height is. But it's a it's a tensor. You can just think of the tensor, vectorize the tensor, put all the numbers in one vector, and then uh, then map it back to I guess five uh, uh, five dimensional scores. Okay. So this is just a way to read uh, a network. So now let's look at parameter count. Like, why are we uh, interested in CNNs, right? Uh, so, uh, so let's say input tensor is of size 90 times 90 times 100, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so input tensor is uh, 90 times 90 times 100. Uh, sorry, 10. Uh, so 10, just because I'm thinking of an intermediate uh, tensor. Something which was computed not at the first layer. Image would be 90 times 90 times 3, but let's say if it's 90 cross 90 pixels, uh, some in intermediate tensor. And let's say we have five filters, okay? Uh, sorry, five filters. 
uh, their depth has to be the same as the input depth, right? So uh, this 10, oops, has to be the same as this 10. And uh, I just chose filter size to be three, three cross three and uh, stride one and zero padding one uh, is just, a, I guess a technical detail, but it doesn't really, I mean, what it ultimately affects is just the size of the output, okay? Uh, how, how, how big is the width and how big is the height of the output tensor, okay? Uh, given, given, and it turns out that if your stride is one and uh, zero padding is one, the output tensor will be exactly the same size, okay? So this you can, uh, this you should uh, do it offline to see, uh, irrespective of whether the numbers are 90 cross, 90 times 90 or whether it's, you know, some 10 cross 10, if you have a three cross three filter and stride is one and zero padding is one, then you'll get the same size output, okay? Yeah. No, that's the input. So you could have 10 or 20. Oh, you're saying image would be three, right? I mean, that would be the RGBs. Yeah, input would be three, but once you process it using, let's say, con layer, it, let's say it had 10 filters, then that's out, that guy's output would be a 10 depth tensor. So I'm, think, I'm talking about that 10 depth tensor, yeah. yeah. Um, For the first layer, we'll have to just filters, yeah, yeah, I mean the filter depth would be three. So this choice would be three here. So the one I underlined would be three. And, uh, and so the number of parameters you can just see it's five, uh, you know, five filters of this size plus one for a bias, let's say, so one number that I add uh, to every computation. Uh, yeah, uh, so these are the number of uh, parameters, right? Uh, but if you look at, I mean, the number of inputs is 81,000. I mean, number of input values, right? Uh, if you wanted to get the same size output, right? It's uh, 90 times 90 times five, which is uh, this number. To get that, I just multiplied those two and it's probably this or bigger than this, okay? It's basically three billion numbers, okay? So by just reusing the weights, so I mean, all we're doing is spatially reusing the filter weights, and so we have reduced the dimensionality. By increasing the number of filters, we are increasing the dimensionality, but in not, in a, in a slightly mild way than thinking of like, a, um, compared to a fully connected network, okay? So this is the number of parameters reduction I was talking about. Any questions? Some of you seem to be not happy with the, okay. No, so RGB would be if, if it was 90 cross 90 cross three, here I'm saying this would be the input tensor. So let me just draw this, oh, this doesn't let me do that, okay. Um, Okay, so your, let's, let's take, take of CIFAR 10, right? Think of CIFAR 10, which is the assignment uh, data set, okay? So there's an image, okay? Image of, uh, let's say, a person, right? So this image is actually, in terms of numbers, is gonna be, uh, you know, we'll have R, G, and B channels, okay? And each channel will have uh, 32 cross 32 here in this particular data set size, okay? So I stack them together and, and I'm calling them as a, a tensor, right? Right, that's like stacking three matrices together and I'm calling it a tensor. Now let's say the first layer is a CNN layer, okay? So what would a CNN layer comprise of? A bunch of filters, okay? So let's say uh, that there are 10 filters, okay? 10 filters just means uh, those filters will be three cross three cross three. So what is the last third? Uh, the last dimension is the same as the number of channels I have at the input, okay? So let's say I have 10 of these, 10 of these guys. Then my output, let's say I do uh, a zero padding of one, uh, you know, zero padding just means I've added a bunch of zeros to the edges, okay? Increase the dimension of the matrix, each matrix, right? Each of the matrix by, by one, one dimension on each side. And I do a stride of one, which means that I move the, this three cross three thing, uh, spatially just one column at a time. Then it turns out that the output is also gonna be 32 cross 32. But now the third coordinate would be the number of filters, okay? Which would be 10 in this case, because there were 10 of these, okay? And that example was just, uh, where is it? 
And that example was talking about now, given this tensor, you know, think of that 90 and 90 as 32 cross 32. Given that tensor, now a subsequent layer, if it has five filters, would have these many parameters. Okay, so you can actually increase the number of parameters quite a quite a bit. Sorry, increase the number of filters quite a bit, and you will not really, you know, you'll only have like thousands of parameters. Okay. So compare this with linear regression, right? If you're just doing linear regression, you would have, even if your input was like 100 dimensional, you would have uh, 100 parameters, 101 parameters. Here, the con layer has, uh, depending on the number of filters, there's a linear increase in the number of parameters. It, you know, it's in hundreds. But this guy, you know, depending on the input and output dimension that you desire, it's in billions, okay? Those many numbers you need to train or update based on gradient descent, it's just too much, okay? Um, I don't know if this goes forward. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So, any questions about that? Is just a quick recap of CNN. Yeah, you get to choose. So, this is your design choice, whether it's ten or a hundred or a uh, thousand. People choose thousand, for example. Uh, Any other questions? Okay, so it used to be, you know, uh, when CNNs really took off, I mean, have took, taken off several times, and, you know, from 2012 to 2015, 16, uh, when they had a resurgence because of GPUs and so on, when they beat the best, best benchmark, state of the art in ImageNet classification tasks and so on, uh, initially there was a lot of, skepticism from, uh, you know, some parts of uh, uh, the community saying that it's kind of really hard to understand what's going on with these uh, really highly nonlinear functions. Ultimately, they're just functions, right? So it's not clear what's going on. So uh, then few researchers try to kind of reason, you know, come up with some ways to kind of uh, diagnose. Once you've already trained a network, figure out like, uh, you know, what's happening uh, with the network. You know, what is it good at? What is it bad at? Um, what are the, what are the weights? you know, eventually mean for my classification problem and so on, okay. So, so this anyway, I visualize. So this is just a visualization of the connection architecture. So the first thing you can do is uh, pretty uh, straightforward. You can just try to visualize the uh, uh, activations themselves. So you have already trained a network, right? Now you can say, okay, I have the network, I have the weights. Let me give a pass an input, for example, the image of a car, and see at every layer, I have a, I have a tensor, but I can look at every slice of the tensor, right? And I can just look at which neurons are positive, which neurons are zero, because, you know, every layer kind of typically is connected with any way, I mean, con layers, forget about the pooling layers, they're not very critical uh, to understand. Uh, the con layers output, you know, it's basically an output of a max of zero comma some number, right? If the number is negative, it's zero, the number is positive, it's, uh, the number is there. So you can just try to visualize what's happening, uh, uh, which which neurons have a positive number, okay? Which neurons have a positive number or what activations are positive, okay? Uh, but really it doesn't give much intuition. Maybe in the first con layer, it detects edges. Actually here you can, I don't know if you can see, uh, but uh, like the top column, top row, for example, is detecting some edges, okay? So that's the, I'm just visualizing the uh, first con, first con layer. Uh, activations. So this layer, for example, has uh, six times six, 36 filters, right? So it has 36 filters. I just counted the number of columns and rows, okay? So it has 36 filters, the thing on the left, and we are just looking at which pixels got uh, activated, okay? So which uh, neurons got activated, okay? Uh, at the first con layer, yeah, sure, they may detect edges and you can, since you know what the input, you know, in, input is an image, so maybe it's detecting edges, you can visualize it. But at the, you know, later layers, you can't really, you don't really know what's, ha what's happening because it's a, it's a huge tensor. In fact, here you can see the number of filters is like huge, right? Uh, maybe hundreds uh, here. Uh, you, you can see that some neurons are getting activated and so on, but it's kind of hard to figure out uh, what's happening semantically. But you can still do something, which is, you can pass your, uh, so one simple thing you can do is you can, uh, once you've trained a network, so we're not really doing any training now, you can pass all your in, all your training data images and at every neuron, see how many times it turned on, as in it was positive, 
versus uh, how many times it was zero. Okay, I'm just saying that at every neuron, you can just collect the statistics of okay with the strain data, the strain trained network. How many times was it zero? How many times was it non-zero? It's just empirical statistics of you know how many times did that neuron actually activate? Okay, you can do that, right? If you have a uh, thousand images and you have thousand numbers, thousand out of thousand times, how many times did it activate? How many times did it not activate? Okay, there could be some neurons, some locations where it never activated. Okay, which means that whatever, what does it mean for a? Okay. So. If a neuron is not activated, which just means that, uh, so this is the activation, right? So there's a pre-activation, there is some number which is the max of that, and the pre-activation Z is generally something like W times uh, some input plus B, okay, right? Uh, actually, uh, one row of this guy. This this guy will give many guys and uh, one, one row of this, okay? If this did not activate, the local gradient of its output with respect to its input is zero, okay? So this function is something like this, right? So ReLU, you've you, you all used ReLU in your Keras thing uh, where you had default dense layers and you had ReLU as, an, as a non-linearity, right? So I'm just saying that the local gradient here, if it's, uh, you know, if it, if it did pass, uh, if its activation was positive and it passed something to, you know, the next guy, uh, then its local gradient is one and otherwise it's zero. So if the, if the neuron did not activate, then no gradients pass through it anyway, okay? Because local multiplication is zero. So no gradients was passed to the W matrix to update the W matrix through, through that neuron, okay? And neither did that neuron contribute to any summations or additions in the, future, in, in, in the forward part. So it's like you can delete, the, delete those neurons, as in they are dead, essentially. They're not really contributing to either gradients passing through them or computing any information to the forward, you know, the next computations happening, right? So you can uh, diagnose those types of issues uh, by not, maybe not by visualizing, but at least computing empirical statistics of uh, which neurons, which uh, activations were, how, how were the activations uh, in your train network, okay? Or on your training data, for example. And is that clear? But it's, but it's, okay, so what does it mean? So if a lot of neurons were dead, let's say, that just means, you know, they never passed any gradient forward then you should probably adjust your, uh, you know, maybe then all the numbers are negative. Numbers getting computed are negative. Maybe you initialize all the weight matrices, uh, W values to be like, let's say minus 100 or something. And that means that it doesn't matter what the input is, the total, you know, sum of, you know, the weights times the inputs is gonna be a negative number and it's all done. So, so that's why, uh, you know, you can figure out like what's happening with your, ne with your network, um, okay? So second attempt could be to visualize weights themselves. Uh, but the problem is weights, unfortunately, are also not very interpretable, except for maybe the first layer. Uh, so what are these weights? These are weights of the, these are the weights of the, uh, the filter. So in the first layer, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many filters there are, but uh, in the first layer, you can visualize the filters and see uh, how, you know, what pixels, what values it took. And you can see, uh, you know, there's some uh, analogy with uh, the image itself because the filter depth is also three, so it's like an image. So you can look at uh, uh, which part of, the, you know, because the filter will detect an edge, for example, if the corresponding uh, weights uh, in that filter are gonna be positive, for example. We saw some filters, right? Some uh, hand engineered p filters last time uh, in a URL where I was showing uh, uh, person's image and uh, there was a pre-designed filter which was capturing some pa parts, right? So you can kind of, at least in the first con layer, you can understand what's happening, understand what's happening with the filters. But beyond that, it's not clear. Well, how do you visualize the filters? Because again, filter depth is the input tensor depth. So there are too many such slices. You, you know, of course, each slice is a matrix. So you can always try to see what the, you know, you can just plot the matrix and see which, which entries are positive or negative, but it's not clear how they'll help you in interpretation. Anyway, so these are two negative, I guess a little bit negative uh, points about visualizing weights or activations. Um, but these are a couple of attempts. I mean, you can try to, uh, there's no, it's not clear how much they'll help you, but you can definitely plot them and see what's happening. 
with the weights themselves. Okay. A third one is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, is also is, is an interesting starting point, and it's more connected to what you might have seen before uh, with some other data sets, which is that uh, you can visualize uh, whether the network, you know, trained well in a, in this in the following sense, which is that you have that network which has a bunch of layers, right? Let's say the last layer is a fully connected layer. I'm going to use FC to represent the fully connected layer. Um, let's say it's a uh, thousand dimensions. Okay. So there was an input image. There were a bunch of trains, weights already trained. You've already trained the network. A uh, bunch of intermediate computations. These are tensors, let's say. And I got a fully connected net, fully connected uh, layer. There's a bunch of activations. Um, you know, it's a, in a vector form. So you can think of. Uh, but let's say we, we are doing, let's say in CIFAR 10, we are doing a 10 class classification. So if you think of the score vectors, um, score vector is going to be 10 dimensional for a CIFAR 10 eventually, which which will transform to a loss value and then you'll backdrop, right? So let's say at the last layer, you also use ReLU. So which means that uh, this fully connected layer, what I was talking about is this H, okay? H is a activation vector, which is 1000 dimensional. I'm going to take a max of 0 comma H which probably happened even at the fully connected layer itself. And then I'm going to multiply with W times B, where W is going to be um, is such that it's going to compress this 1,000 numbers to uh, 10 numbers. And then you will do this log transformation to get to probability that that image is of class 1, class 2, class 10. And then you'll get the you know cross entropy loss. right? So all I'm saying is forget about the last weight matrix. There's a bunch of activations that are computed. Uh, these activations can be considered as representation of the image. Okay. Why not the last layer itself? So why not the scores themselves as a representation of the image? Uh, you can, but the scores are basically you know are constrained by the dimensionality of your classification task. Okay. So you can think of all I'm trying to say is a very simple thing, which is that you have an input image, you did a lot of transformations, but right before the final transformation, which led to ten scores. For the ten class classification problem, uh, you if you look at the activations, it's you know it's probably higher dimensional, maybe thousand, maybe four thousand ninety six or whatever. Uh, you can think of that as a representation of your image, by which I mean the image has been transformed to another space where the vector represents that image. Okay, that's all I mean. Okay, just think of a transformed transformation of that image. Okay. Now for each image, there's going to be such vector, right? You already train the network, pass every training image through that, and you get these vectors. Now forget about the images. You have vectors in instead of images. Now, given vectors, that's your data. So for each image, you have a, essentially a vector, which is a fee you can think of that as a feature vector. And I'm calling that a um, embedding generally, but doesn't matter. So think of it as a feature vector for the image. Now I can actually um, to understand whether the CNN worked well. I want to understand if these vectors have some sort of a clustering property. In the sense that, see, these these vectors are going to be transformed to get to scores, right? And let's say there's a you know there's a bunch of vectors for cars, a bunch of vectors for uh, uh, like a house. Okay, so these vectors, you know, eventually get transformed to ten-dimensional vectors, the uh, scores, where if they're all cars, hopefully the car coordinate is the highest. And if they're all uh, you know houses, then the ho house coordinate is the highest. Okay, that's a linear transformation, right? Uh, if if they need to have these uh, particular score coordinates highest, then they better have some sort of a clustering property in the sense they are hopefully they are similar to each other, right? That's all I'm saying, because it's a linear transformation. So think of linear transformation like uh, uh, for linear transformation, you know, if you have similar vectors, you will have similar outputs. You know, linear functions are like that. Whereas nonlinear function is not clear. Okay, similar inputs can have uh, arbitrary different outputs. Okay, so all I'm trying to say here is that for each image you have a thousand-dimensional representation, and those vectors hopefully have some sort of a clustering or some sort of a um, uh, similarity property with each other if they are of the same class. Class. Okay, if the CNN is trained well, then this should be the consequence of those. You know, this should be the consequence. If the CNN is not trained well, then those thousand-dimensional vectors can be, you know, anywhere. Like uh, because the CNN is not performing well, then for an image of a house, it could be that the score vector for, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
car would be high or something like that, right? So if, if the CNN is trained well, then these vectors are, you know, capture some similarity property, and then you can actually just do uh, projection, you know, PCA or equivalent of PCA. So you can project these vectors down to dimensions where we can actually visualize, maybe three dimensions or two dimensions, okay, or even one dimension. You can project these vectors down. So we are reducing from thousand dimensionals to two dimensions or three dimensions or one dimension. In this case, two dimensions. So that means that I put those each image, so the vector corresponds to each image in a two dimension 2D point, okay, on a, in a, for example, a restricted space like this, uh, where the projection operation is done by something like, uh, you know, here we use TSNE, but there are other uh, tools, you know, for example, PCA that you already know about, you know. Uh, so what's the difference between something called TSNE and uh, uh, PCA is that PCA is a linear projection operation and TSNE is going to be some sort of a nonlinear projection operation. But ultimately you're going from thousand dimensions to two dimensions. And then what you do is given those points, place the image, I mean in this, in this illustration what they've done is instead of the point, they place the image of the point corresponding to that point, that thousand dimension vector on the, uh, uh, here, uh, next to each other so that they made a collage of these images. And they want to visually inspect uh, whether similar images are in the similar regions of this collage, okay? If they are in the similar parts of this collage, then, then the network has learned something, okay? It has learned vectors which are similar to each other if the input images is, is the same, okay? Any, any questions at this point? You can ask, okay, why can't I just project an image itself onto low dimensions? Uh, like two dimensions and, and see what happens. You can't, I mean, think of an image, right? It's not, it's just a square with some lot of structure. Maybe vectorize it and project it into low dimensions. It's not gonna correspond to similar images, you know, images of all cats and images of all houses will not be, you know, clustered together. Here you will see, I mean, here you can't really see because it's really small, but you can go to that link and uh, see that this is, uh, this is the case, that you will see uh, bluish, you know, certain classes in the same area and some other classes in the same area. It's just a way to say that, okay, that the thing trained something, you know. It trained representations of images where similar images are in the same uh, vector space and therefore they'll evaluate to the same score or things of that nature. Any questions? Okay. So next one is, is, is a very fun uh, way to understand whether the CNN did something, you know, what the train, your train network has something, has learned something well or not. And in fact, maybe in your assignment you can do this as a bonus, uh, which is you can try to understand uh, for an input image, for a certain class, take some representative images from each class. In CIFAR 10, there are 10 classes. So maybe you take a few images from each class. Uh, and then you want to figure out, you have the train network. What you do is you occlude the image and uh, figure out whether occluding the image at different parts still corresponds to the same score and the same class. What do I mean by that? Uh, let's look at these three pictures, okay? So, the three uh, images here, right? So, look at the first one, it's a Pomeranian. And uh, there is this gray block here, right? So, we put the gray block there, that's a new transformed image, I mean, that's a modified image. And we'll pass that image to the network through our train network. And then we'll see, given that the block is there, what is my, uh, what is my predicted probability? Actually, this is also red, so you can't really see. Uh, let's say, yeah. So let's say the picture on the right side, okay. Given that the block is there, what is my predicted probability that uh, uh, this image is of a Afghan hound, okay. So what is this picture? What is this pixel corresponding to? Given the block over there, what is my predicted probability that this is a Afghan hound? So we are just, so what is this plot? This plot, every, every number in this plot is the probability that it belongs to the true class. The true class is, uh, you know, Afghan hound, car wheel, and Pomeranian. As you slide this, maybe the idea is that if you slide this over the Afghan hound, it should not predict, you know, probability of that class being, you know, probability of that image being in, uh, of, of class Afghan hound should be zero. And blues represent zero, okay? Blues represent low values and reds represent high values. So you can see that as you don't occlude the Afghan hound, 
you get high values. In fact, if you occlude the face of that person, you get the highest values of that. This is an image of an upturn horn. Okay. Uh, if you occlude the wheel, it's not predicting that it's a wheel. But uh, if you occlude, uh, yeah, there. I mean, if you're occluding maybe the face region, you're 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 not detecting the uh, the particular class. Okay. So it's just a way to understand which parts, which parts of the input images are actually picking up to classify something as a particular class. Is that fine? Okay. So, okay, the last part is a little bit uh, messy, uh, which I'll just very, uh, you know, just give you a point or two, but uh, we'll not discuss more. Is that you have the train network, okay? So you have the train network. Which is which has weights already, right? Some input image went all the way to activate. Let's say there are ten classes. Okay, the different probabilities. Maybe this probability is the highest. Maybe this is 0 0.9. Everything is else is 0 0.01 or something like that, right? So the ten numbers which which you know these scores are these probabilities that came out for that image, right? So what we want to do is to figure out now the network is fixed. We want to figure out. What could have been the input image that would give me a score of one? Okay, the network is already trained. We are not changing the weights, but we are asking change the input, change that input image, 32 cross 32 cross 3 or whatever. Tell me what is the best image that would have given me this particular score of one and everything else zero. Okay, that's a training problem. That's a different optimization problem, right? It's a it's a problem where I want to I'm searching over images. Okay, by changing the values of each pixel in each channel, keep changing it such that there will be a final image which will give me a particular coordinate to be score of uh, one, okay, or 0 0.9, whatever. Okay. So, what, what's your question? So this is all, you know, this is this is a diagnosis of a pre, you know, already trained networks. So we are just trying to understand what would be the image which would, you know, fire a particular neuron essentially, or which would activate, you know, because we know that at the final layer there is only ten classes, then there will be ten, you know, score vectors ten dimensional, and if we want the score for the first guy to be highest and everything else to be low, there has to be some image corresponding to that, uh, you know, which will get us that score, right? We are just asking that the network is fixed. What would be that image which would have gotten that score? Okay. There are ways. There are ways to figure that out. You know, find. You know, do that optimization. It's not. I mean, naively, you may think that it is easy to optimize. You know, you can still do gradient descent. Find a loss function which would be. You know, as you change these. You know, pixel values. There'll be some loss value which is how much did it activate the first score? Uh, that would be loss value. You can gradient descent back and find the best pixels. It's not just uh, that. There are some other considerations that go into it. But ultimately, you know, the, the but the highest level. That's the idea. It's like a gradient descent on a different uh, set of numbers. Okay, is to understand the what type of images are triggering, uh, you know, the the you know which type of images or which is the best image is classifying, you know, a cat or a dog or something. And actually, there are a bunch of pictures here. Um, so you can see that I mean I don't know if you can see uh, like. This is a crazy image of a goose. I mean, a bunch of goose uh, structured things. Okay, you start with noisy type of a starting point, and you get to this type of hallucinated thing that would have uh, uh, triggered the goose coordinate of the score vector the highest. Okay, and similarly ostrich and so on. So you'll not, of course, get a natural image. I mean, the typical, you know, like a photograph, but you'll kind of see, and uh, there's a bunch of. And you don't have to do it all the way to the last layer itself. You can actually do do these types of computations not just at the score level, but at every intermediate level as well. You can say what type of images would have activated uh, some subset of neurons the highest, and you will see that certain patterns of uh, input images would be like uh, at the high at the lowest level. You will see that edge detections, uh, and beyond those levels, the images which would have activated these neurons uh, would be you know more complex patterns and so on. Okay. 
But the way to compute this is a little bit non-straightforward. Uh, uh, but you can see that reference which got cut, deep viz is the name of the uh, reference. Okay. Uh, any questions about that part? I didn't really get into the detail, but the high-level idea is to get the best image, okay, which will activate a particular neuron the highest. And uh, so the last part is to understand, okay, I don't want to hallucinate about the best image that would have given me the score. Tell me which image in my training data set led to the highest score, uh, you know, higher scores, uh, uh, yeah, uh, higher scores as in highest activations of neurons, okay. So, so here is a, is a just an illustration of uh, uh, like you pick a neuron and then you figure out like which uh, images in my training data set led to the highest uh, uh, activation of that, that neuron, okay? And uh, what are these boxes? Because neurons, you know, all neurons don't see every part of the input image, okay? For example, uh, For example, if, if the input image is uh, like this, uh, maybe 32 cross 32, you know, uh, the first filter, okay, uh, let's say filter is three cross three, then it will look at a three cross three part of the input, right? It's not three cross three, but it'll look at a three cross three part of the input and uh, activate, you know, and create an output slice, some entry in the output uh, slice, right? Element-wise multiplication, compute, take a max of zero comma something. Now, if you wanna say what part of the input image that this particular cell see, as in C in the sense, what inputs did, were part of this computation, it's not the whole image, right? It's only a part, you know, it's only like uh, the top three cross three part, right? So, um, so only the, Maybe the last, you know, final layer neurons may be looking at the whole image through a lot of uh, these receptive fields I was talking about, which is the sizes of the uh, size of the filters. So if you pick an intermediate neuron and ask which part of the input image did that neuron see, it may be a smaller part of the input image region. Okay. So anyway, so that's that's why there are some boxes, but ultimately they are just picking up. Uh, which which images activated the neurons the most? Okay. Uh, and how do you do this? Actually, so I just told you. Okay, this uh, at the high level, the way you do do this is now again you have a train network. You have a bunch of input images. Maybe pick of a certain class. Let's say houses. You just want to figure out which one were the top ones which uh, uh, triggered a particular neuron the most. You can just do linear search. You can just uh, go through each image and see which image, which of these images uh, triggered this particular neuron the highest. Okay. So that gives you an idea of, for this neuron, these are the guys who would trigger it the most. That's all. I mean, that's a very naive way of doing it, but uh, it's not difficult to, I mean, there are ways to do it efficiently, but this is the idea. Okay. So it's just a way to understand, how are we understanding the neural network? We're just saying, there are a bunch of weights, a lot of nonlinear transformations happening, but we want to understand at least from the point of view of how are they getting triggered? Are they detecting some patterns in the input image? Okay, that's roughly the high level idea. And uh, that's it for this part. Any questions? Yes. Sorry, I don't understand this visualizing by occlusion. By occlusion. Oh, occlusion just means uh, you have already trained your network in all these cases. Now we are saying, now we are saying, pick an image, representative image, like let's say this, uh, um, like car wheel, the one in the center, and uh, we are asking, I have that image. Let me modify that image by blocking or changing the pixel values of a small region to all zeros, and then if I pass that through my neural network it will give me a score with some probability that this is a car wheel and with some probability it's not a car wheel. The bottom row is showing what is the probability that it's a car wheel, always. As I move my occlusion, so occlusion is really small, right? That shaded, I mean, that crossed area that I have. I keep moving the occlusion and I'll get one number, which is the probability that it's a car a car wheel, okay? Move it a little bit left, probably there's a car wheel. I just stack it nicely in a square. That, that's what happened here. And I'm saying that if you occlude the wheel itself, 
like if you have a gray box here, you know, parts of the wheel, in fact, here, if you occlude the parts of the wheel, you are losing the information that it's a wheel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once it is string, can you get an image of Spark that what it is thinking as a car? Like, Spark calculate everything. Yeah, that's what that's what we show showed this one, right? Uh, synthesize images. So we are figuring out what would have what is it thinking when it fires? You know, when it says something is a car, what would be the prototypical image? Uh, I mean, you can't really see. I don't know. Uh, but for example. This is the class gorilla. It's, this is the protocol image which would have triggered the gorilla class in the in the in the classification task. But it doesn't look like a natural image, right? It's it's uh, this is the best image that would trigger it to say something is a gorilla. Okay. But even Nash. So first of all, I mean, you can't just do this optimization directly. There's some tricks involved. Uh, but this is a prototypical image. So I hope this answers your question. Yeah, that would be something like this. Yeah. Yeah. So, what would trigger it? Trigger it to classify something as a red car would be images like these. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't look like real images. <laughs> yeah. You will see. Even in these images, you can find uh, patterns of uh, things, right? So maybe not these images, but like here, you can see oh, ostrich means there's going to be a neck and there's going to be, uh, you know. Uh, wings and so on. What it has saw, seen in the training data. Okay. Same thing with uh, goose. I mean, how is it differentiating between goose and uh, ostrich? Right. So these don't look like natural images, but this is a way to understand whether it's, you know, this this type of an image would trigger the goose class the scoring the highest, and this type of image would trigger the uh, ostrich class the highest. Okay. So. So next, uh, let's go to transfer learning. Okay. So you'll see that uh, in fact the second assignment is about transfer learning, uh, at least for the first question. So very few people. The idea is that very few people actually tra train neural networks from scratch, uh, unless you are a res researcher or you are in some of these uh, some of these groups which have computational capabilities. You will not train neural networks from scratch. Uh, now there's an ecosystem where there are pre-trained networks, and uh, even if you have small amount of data, in this case we are mostly focusing on images in this class, uh, in this lecture. But even if you have small amount of images, let's say 100 images of each class, okay, then you can still train your network, train an, eventually a network which would be a deep network, which would classify this 100 images versus 100 images or whatever whatever classes you have. With all, you know, with very high accuracy, depending on how well the pre-trained network is. For example, ImageNet has a thousand classes, uh, has a lot more than thousand classes, but thousand classes class classifier, pre-trained classifiers are already available. Okay, they already classify at a really high accuracy level, it's like uh, um, best in five classification, which means that tell me five top candidates and one of them is the correct one. Uh, such a metric, it's a different error metric than zero one classification. They're already reaching 94, 95 or whatever is the percentage accuracy, which means that uh, human accuracy is about 93% okay, on that data. So they already beat humans uh, accuracy. So if, if, if your classification problem is similar to these ImageNet classes, then you will, can expect that even with 100 images of two types, you will already reach uh, you know, uh, 90 or 80% accuracy directly. Okay? So you don't really have to start from scratch. If you only had 100 images and you want to try, train a uh, you know 10 convolutional layer neural network you will not be able to get anywhere okay so that's the idea of pre training uh, so that's the idea of transfer learning and we'll see two approaches pretty both of them are straightforward uh, first one is called uh, feature extraction and then uh, we already saw an example of that when we said we'll do projection um, i mean this uh, embedding of images and see whether they are similar and so on and the second thing is fine tuning okay so uh, both these are loosely termed as transfer learning uh, there are other types of transfer learning uh, which we'll not get into, but this, these are the two examples that we'll see. Okay, so let's see the first one before we take a break. Uh, 
So what is transfer by feature extraction? It's uh, um, it's it's as follows. So you first get a pre-trained uh, convolutional neural network uh, or or any architecture. So here I just gave names of uh, two networks which were famous at some time uh, back in 2012 and 2013. Okay. Now I guess uh, the ones which are famous are uh, I guess ResNets and uh, ResNex and so on. There are different names to these uh, architectures depending on the groups who did develop them. Uh, for example, VGG is I think Visual Geometry Group from Oxford. I think that's all. Uh, uh, so there are some networks which are pre-trained and people have people have uh, uh, given the weights that they trained when they trained the network, the final weights that they got for the network, they, they just give you the weights. Okay. What you do then is, uh, for example, if the last fully connected network before you get to, so the last fully connected is actually um, uh, outputs 1000 thousand scores because this, these are, let's say these are uh, trained on ImageNet. ImageNet was a 1000 class classification problem. So of course the last layer scores would be 1000 dimensional. So the last layer uh, outputs uh, these many numbers, right? Um, what you do is, uh, so that's this, this, let's say this, in this pictorial diagram, it's this layer, okay, the one on the bottom right. What you do is you remove that, remove that layer, okay? What does it mean to remove that layer? It's, it's uh, the same as saying whatever the activations are here, those are my final vector representations of the inputs. And let me not worry about classification now. Okay, that's it. There's nothing going on. Uh, so, okay. So, for example, in this, uh, so this is just an example illustration of a network, uh, which is the AlexNet network. Okay, it looks pretty messy, but think of those boxes as the sensors and uh, uh, some. Um, so the diagrams are trying to illustrate both the filter sizes and so on, but let's not worry about it. So there's a bunch of sequence of convolutional layers with max pool uh, in them. Uh, so you can see that the last layer is 1000 dimensional here, and the last but one layer is uh, 4096 dimensional here. Okay. So what you do is you drop this, the weights corresponding to 1000 dimensional, uh, and for each image you have now a 4096 4, dimensional vector that, that you can get for your trained data. But now we just have a uh, pre-trained network. So what we'll do is uh, input these activations to a linear or a non-linear classifier, by which I mean now we have a train network, we drop the remove the layer. Now what does what is this block now? It's just saying I can transform an input image to a vector. That's all. So just use that block, you know, in your task, in your task, which, which may only have 100 images of each type, you just pass all your 100 images through this block, you'll get those, uh, you know, 4096 dimensional vectors. Now, given those vectors, just train a shallow classifier, just to SVN, uh, sorry, um, support vector machines or maybe other things, okay? That's it. So, I mean, here I'm not showing it that way, but uh, essentially that's what you do. It's like saying, I'm not going to, I'm just going to use it as a feature extractor. It's going to extract these 4096 dimensional features. And then I'm going to train my, uh, you know, I can just use that as feature vectors in a classification, uh, in a classifier, for example, a logistic regression classifier or something like that. Okay. 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 So that was uh, feature extraction. And Let's take a break for nine minutes. Uh, let's resume at uh, 7.35, okay.